So our speaker is uh, Bob Scherer. He's professor and uh, chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Vanderbilt University. He received his PhD uh, here at uh, the University of Chicago. His research area is cosmology, encompassing work on dark energy, dark matter, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, and the large-scale structure of the universe. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, and among other awards, is the recipient of the Klopstek Memorial Award of the American Association of Physics Teachers and the Ohio State University Alumni Award for Distinguished Teaching. He is the author of a textbook on quantum mechanics uh, called An Accessible Introduction, Quantum Mechanics, An Accessible Introduction, and uh, has published several popular science articles and science fiction short stories. Uh, he is uh, a, the secretary of the Society of Catholic Scientists and co-founder of it. He's also a good friend of mine. We've actually written a couple of papers together. Uh, he's going to tell us about Georges Lemaitre. I, most, some people say Lemaitre, some people say Lemaitre. I asked a good friend of mine who's French, uh, Xavier Calmet, who's a devout Catholic physicist, and I said, how are you supposed to say that name? And it's something like Lemaitre. But I think I can't keep saying that consistently. So <laughs> you, you, Bob will say it however he's most comfortable saying it. You didn't tell the story. I'm not going to tell the story. Oh, I, I'll tell the story. So I was showing my, one of my children, I have five kids, and I was showing my oldest daughter, Victoria, our, bo our website with the board. And our board is people from Harvard and University of Chicago and Vanderbilt and, and, uh, and wow. here I am and Cornell, and here I am at the University of, De of Delaware, and she said, boy, you know, they chose the least impressive person to be the president. <laughs> and uh, so I emailed Bob, and I told him this, and he said, a prophet is without honor in his own family. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm uh, happy to be here. Uh, I, I wanted to begin with two preliminaries uh, before I begin the talk. Um, First of all, I was asked mostly to talk about Georges Lemaitre's um, science, not necessarily his philosophy or how he saw his connection between science and religion, but I know that there are actually some members of the audience who have studied this question in a bit more detail than I have, so I'm going to try to stop early so we can have a lot of time for questions and discussions at the end of the talk. And secondly, for those of you who are n uh, native speakers of French, I'm going to apologize in advance for butchering your language. Um, <laughs> To start with, I, you know, most in the scientific world, most of the controversy about Lemaitre, if there is any controversy, revolves around the question, of is he, did he really get enough credit for his contributions to the Big Bang? Um, and I think there's a couple preliminaries we need to go over if we're going to talk about that. One is that scientists are famously ignorant of their own history. When we give a, ta give a, a class, we don't want to waste all our time talking about, you know, the history of the subject. We just get, get on with it. And the same thing is true in our research. We're mostly interested in pursuing new things, and we don't often delve into what happened in the past. Um, and that has several corollaries. One is that the, the history of science as it's presented in our classes, the sort of cartoon version, uh, is science is this straight path to the truth. And those of us who are working scientists, and that's almost everyone in this room, knows that there's sort of a thousand dead ends for every one breakthrough, if, if even you get a breakthrough at all. Um, and it's also very common when we're giving our cartoon version of history to say that discovery A was made by person A and discovery B was made by person B and this discovery is attributed to C. And again, in our own work, we know that that's almost never the case, that it, you know, it's usually co-authored papers or if one person builds on somebody else's work and it's usually almost impossible to sort of go backwards and figure out who did what. Uh, and the corollary of this has often been called Stigler's Law and that's the law that nothing ever gets named after the right person. Um, Stigler and Stigler didn't say that. I, I, I think that's actually true. Um, now, none of this should be surprising to any of us because it's all simply, as we know, a consequence of original sin and, and, and probably not the most important consequence. So. Um, the Big Bang Theory had many fathers but it had only one father with a capital F, and that was Georges Lemaitre, who was eventually named a Monsignor. Uh, he was born in 1894 and died in 1966. And I want to put his, uh, his contribution in perspective. I think the, one of the most impressive things about Lemaitre uh, 
is if you look at the kind of early history of cosmology and not just the, the kind of straightforward uh, cartoon history that we teach in our classes, um, there were several theorists who were making significant contributions like Einstein and Friedman. Um, there were observers like Slipher and Hubble, but they often weren't even aware of each other's work. I mean, the theorists were developing these great theories and didn't actually realize that it applied to the real universe. The observers were discovering the expansion of the universe without really understanding what it was that they had discovered. Now, that kind of disconnect never happens anymore, as you know. But um, it certainly was, was, was happening back then. And Lemaitre managed to bridge those two worlds. He had a foot in the observer camp. He was not in a, and, and a foot in the theory camp. And I think that's really what enabled him to make as much progress as he did. So if you have advice for your students, that's the advice I would give them. Emulate Lemaitre, uh, not necessarily become a priest, but emulate Lemaitre and, and try to keep a hand in both the worlds of theory and observation. So modern cosmology really begins with Einstein. So in 1916, uh, Einstein invented general relativity, and this is one of the rare cases where I think we can say one person, one theory. Uh, he, was, he was really the, the it came a, a whole cloth out of his mind. Uh, and only a year later, he added a cosmological constant to the theory. And the reason was, that he realized that that was the only way to have a static universe. And at the time, everybody knew that the universe was motionless. It was not expanding or contracting or doing much of anything. It was just a collection of stars, and it was just sitting there. Um, and we really can't blame Einstein because that's, well, we'll see. There were some observations that were suggestive of other things, but that was basically the data supported that point of view. So he added the cosmological constant to allow a static universe. Now later, um, when he realized that if he had not put the cosmological constant in, he could have predicted the expanding universe and been even more insanely famous than he was. <laughs> he made the famous statement that the cosmological constant was his greatest blunder. Now that we know there is a cosmological constant, I think we have to amend that to say that saying the cosmological constant was his greatest blunder was, in fact, his greatest blunder. <laughs> But the, the model was self-consistent, it was, it was fine, and, and you know, it, people immediately went off to try to find solutions of the equations. But meanwhile, back in the West, uh, this fellow, Vesto Slipher, was doing some very interesting observations. Now, if you're gonna ask who doesn't get enough credit, I think he's the, the person we really have to give more credit to. Um, Slipher was working in Arizona, and he was making measurements of the recession velocity of nebulae. So um, you've all seen these beautiful pictures. These are not the pictures Slipher saw. I mean, Slipher had this tiny little telescope by modern standards, and what he saw were these blobs through the telescope. And at the time, it wasn't even known whether these things were just dust, uh, um, gas clouds in our own galaxy, which is where we get the word nebulae from, or if they were actually external galaxies. He was measuring the velocities of these galaxies relative to our own velocity, and as happens so many times in science, um, he wasn't looking to discover something revolutionary. He thought that he would see some of the things were moving toward us, some were moving away from us. He could figure out the average frame of reference and get our motion relative to that average frame of reference. Uh, he was using the Doppler effect, which I think is familiar to most of you. It's the fact that as I move toward you, I turn blue. And as I move <laughs> away from you, I turn red. Uh, blue. I, I, I heard a story once that somebody tried to get out of a traffic ticket by claiming they, the red light turned green as they drove toward it. <laughs> and I don't think it worked. I mean, maybe in Chicago it will work. I don't know. But, um, so, of course, the reason we don't see the Doppler effect is because I'm not moving at an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. They, in, the, in the textbooks, they always tell you to listen to a train whistle uh, as though there are still trains in the United States. But um, that was the European thing. And, and as the train moves toward you, you hear it go up in pitch. As it moves away from you, it goes down in pitch. I tell people to listen for a police siren because that's what they're going to hear. Um, and you get the same effect. And the reason, of course, is that as you're cruising down the highway, not exceeding the speed limit, um, you're going at about Mach 0 0.1. So um, that's another way to express your speed. You're getting a, a, a appreciable fraction of the speed of sound. And so you can get the Doppler effect in sound with moving objects at terrestrial velocities, but not with, um, uh, you can't get the Doppler effect with regard to uh, light, unless you're a policeman with a Doppler radar gun. Um, so he was making these measurements, and he made a rather astonishing discovery. Most, and this is my one attempt to use PowerPoint animation. What he discovered is that most of these objects were moving. <laughs> were moving away from him. 
and uh, he had, I think, a sample of 41 galaxies, and about 36 of them were moving away, and only five were moving toward him. Um, and most of the ones that were moving at the highest velocities were the ones moving away from him. So he immediately concluded nothing in particular. He didn't, he didn't assume that the universe was expanding. It looked like we were at the center of a giant explosion, but he didn't have the tools at that point yet to figure out what this, what this meant. But I, I think he really deserves a lot of the discovery for initiating this chain of events. Uh, meanwhile, back in the Soviet Union, where life was very difficult, um, Alexander Friedman was playing around with Einstein's equations, and he wrote down an equation that described an expanding coordinate system, which I'm going to show in the next slide. And it's, this is now known as the Friedman equation. The only controversy about Friedman that I know of is whether you spell his last name with one N or two Ns. But um, he, was, uh, he seems to have been unaware of the astronomical applications. He sort of didn't, didn't sit down and say, oh, are, are galaxies moving away from us now? Is the universe expanding? But he did, in fact, write down this equation. Part of the problem is he died three years later of typhoid, so he didn't live long enough to you know, maybe develop his theory any further. But I'm going to show you the equation he wrote down. This is the only equation in the, for those of you who are equation people, I know some of you are equation people and some of you aren't, but uh, this is the only equation I'm going to write down. Basically, the Friedman equation describes what's called the scale factor. Now, if the universe is finite, you can think of this as the radius of the universe. The universe is almost certainly infinite. So it really describes the separation of two objects measured at two different times. So as, as the universe expands, A basically parameterizes the expansion. And um, the great thing about cosmology is you only have to, have to learn one equation. So for someone like me, that's a big plus. Um, this is the time derivative of the expansion factor. And it depends on the density depends on something called the geometric curvature of space. And then if you want a cosmological constant, you add this third term, which is called lambda, or the cosmological constant. And that describes, given if you know what the universe is made of, and you know the geometry of the universe, you can predict exactly how it's going to expand. But as I said, it, it wasn't clear that Friedman understood the full implications of this equation. He did not go on um, to explore it in any more detail. Um, largely because he wasn't around to explore it in more detail, but he, he, didn't, um, he, di he didn't explore any kind of observational consequences of this. And at this point, Georges Lemaitre enters the scene. So this is a picture of him uh, in, his, oh, whoa, in his youth. Uh, he was born in, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce that, Charleroi, well, as we say in Nashville, Charlie Roy. Um, <laughs> Belgium in 1894. Like so many of his contemporaries, he fought in World War I. I think that's one of the amazing things, that, you know, the terrible tragedies of World War I. Um, I mean, of course, it, it was a tragedy in itself, but of course, that was the war in which Mosley died instead of getting the Nobel Prize. Carl Schwarzschild entered the war and died indirectly from the war. Um, so many scientists actually just volunteered. Now, by the time the second war came along, uh, they were all drafted to, to make weapons of war, but in this war, they all fought in the trenches. He fought in World War I. He came back in 1919 and began his candidacy for the PhD. But um, at that point, he was discerning a vocation. And in 1920, he entered the seminary. And they were on a kind of accelerated schedule. He got permission to study relativity in his spare time. <laughs> now, um, I, I should say, for those of you not in the world of physics, most of us in the world of physics never study general relativity. You can get a PhD in physics go on and have a productive physics career, and never, ever, ever study general relativity. And I, I, I can tell you from personal experience, it is a difficult subject. I mean, it was an exaggeration when Eddington said there's only a dozen people who, who um, understand the theory, and I'm one of them. Um, <laughs> but, but it's still a very difficult theory. So I think it's an amazing thing that he was studying for the priesthood and doing relativity at the same time. Uh, in 1923, he was ordained, uh, and at that point, he went off to Cambridge to work with Arthur Eddington, who probably at that time was the world's second leading expert on relativity after Einstein himself. Um, and then in the following year, he went to MIT to pursue his PhD there. And he visited Harvard, of course, and, and, and talked a lot with Harlow Shapley, who was one of the leading observers of the time. So I think one of the amazing things about um, Lemaitre is he's kind of a Forrest Gump figure. Wherever something was going on, uh, he was there. Um, and then in 1927, he published his famous paper in, uh, in, this, in the Annale de Society of whatever it is, um, <laughs> in French. I, I, you know, I, uh, 
Go ahead. Um, and this is a very impressive paper, um, which I have not read, but I read the secondary sources, including things that people in this room have written. Um, he re-derived the Friedman equation, but most importantly, he, he applied it to observations. He said, this is the equation that describes an expanding universe. And he wrote down what is now called the Hubble equation, which is that the velocity of, uh, velocity of a receding object is proportional to its distance from us with this constant here, uh, which is called h naught, and that's a constant. And the reason that that's so important is that if you have a universe that's expanding and looks the same from every point in the universe, this is the equation it has to obey. And I'm going to show you on this, you can see this on this figure here. If I'm sitting down here looking at a bunch of galaxies and they're all equally spaced away from me, and then at a, some later time, a few billion years later, I measure the same galaxies, they've all expanded, but they've expanded in such a way that each galaxy looks, feels like it's the, ex the center of the universe. We talked about that yesterday. There's no center to the expansion. Everybody uh, expands away uniformly in such a way that each person <coughs> sees the same expansion law. Then you can see that the velocity, which is just the slope of these lines, is exactly proportional to their distance away from me. So that's the expansion law that covers, that governs an expanding universe. The velocity is the Hubble parameter times the distance. Now, his theory was not, in fact, the modern Big Bang. He began the universe with an, basically an eternal universe. This is his 1927 theory. It was later modified. So this is an Einstein static universe. The funny thing about an Einstein static universe is that it's unstable. If you give it a little push one way, it starts to expand. If you push it the other way, it starts to contract. So his universe started out static, uh, and then it, it would, but it was just slightly unstable, and then it would expand uh, into the modern expansion that we see today. So this is very similar to our current view of the universe. The, the horizontal axis is the scale factor. He used R instead of A, and this is the time. It's very similar to our current view of the universe, except it doesn't begin with an initial singularity. It begins with this static state. <coughs> Meanwhile, back in the US, and of course this was in the days when the, all the smart theorists lived in Europe and all the great experimentalists lived in America, and this shows up in the history of cosmology, Edwin Hubble was making measurements of distant galaxies, and he was doing the hard thing. So it's easy to measure uh, redshifts. It's easy to measure velocities. And I say that as a theorist who hasn't looked through a telescope since I was in high school. Um, but they tell me it's easy. Um, <laughs> what's hard is measuring distances. And the way that Hubble did this was to f see objects where he could measure both the absolute brightness. These were the famous Cepheid variable stars. And there, there's a relation between how fast they pulsate and how bright they are. So he could measure their absolute brightness and he could look at their apparent brightness and use that to figure out how far away they had to be to have that apparent brightness. He then plotted up the distance to these objects against their velocity, and he got this beautiful, this looks like one of my labs from high school, uh, he got one of these beautiful graphs where this is the distance on the horizontal axis and this is the speed on the vertical axis, and you can see that there's a straight line that goes through it. Um, and it, you know, I, I make fun of this, but in fact, it is a linear relationship. And as he got better and better data, it made the, the relation better and better. And so that, this is the relation between the velocity and the distance that Hubble discovered empirically. And this is called Hubble's law, not Lemaitre's law. Now, in 1931, Lemaitre followed up uh, with a very short note to Nature um, in which he ta started to talk about how we needed to use quantum theory to uh, describe the beginning of the universe. It's a very uh, uh, um, prescient article. And he then began to develop the idea that the universe did not begin from a, a, a static state, an Einstein static state, but began, in fact, with a singularity. And even I can tell you what these things mean in French. This is the first expansion. He, this is not exactly our modern model. He included this period of stagnation and the reason he did that is that the data at the time, uh, the, the Hubble constant wasn't measured correctly until the 1940s. The, uh, the value that Hubble and his successors measured was off by a factor of 10. Um, and consequently, they predicted an age for the universe that was shorter than the age of the Earth, which is an embarrassment. So um, Lemaitre, always cognizant of the data, put this stagnation period in to allow the universe some extra time to catch up and have a little bit older universe than the one we have today. Um, in the 1940s, this was revised, and we knew that there was, there was in fact, no um, stagnation period. Ironically, this model was resurrected by um, 
Rocky Kolb and some others at the University of Chicago in the 90s to, um, to explain some other phenomena that we weren't sure of. Now it's vanished again. Uh, it's, it's almost certainly not the correct model. Um, and Lemaitre had a lot of other ideas, which I think were very far ahead of his time. Now, he thought that cosmic rays were a relic of the early universe. He was kind of on the right track. There was a relic of the early universe, but it wasn't high-energy cosmic rays. It was the radiation that was left over. On the other hand, um, Lemaitre was absolutely convinced that we needed a cosmological constant. And he had big fights with Einstein about this and with others. The cosmological constant gradually vanished from cosmology as it developed over the years. People were quite convinced there was no cosmological constant until in 1998, um, Perlmutter at Berkeley and uh, the, the Harvard group discovered that, in fact, the universe is accelerating today and we need a cosmological constant. So Lemaitre, in fact, was right about this. He was about um, 60 years ahead of his time. Furthermore, he also always said that the cosmological constant should be treated as a kind of physical energy density rather than a correction to relativity. And that's also a very modern point of view, that we can treat this as a cosmological constant or we can treat it as some kind of mysterious dark energy that powers the acceleration of the universe. So in that way, he was very, very much ahead of his time. Um, <clears throat> from the 1940s onward, he turned his attention away from cosmology to other things. He was particularly interested in using uh, computers to do scientific calculations. Again, he was way ahead of his time in that respect. He got a computer installed at his institution, was working with that. Um, and it's a little unfair to say that he kind of dropped the ball because pretty much everybody stopped looking at cosmology from the 1940s onward. George Gamow and his collaborators developed a kind of abortive Big Bang model, but it didn't really go anywhere in the 50s. And, and what happened was uh, in mid-1960s, Penzias and Wilson, as we heard yesterday, discovered the microwave background, and that led to kind of the rebirth of cosmology as a subject. I mean, I, people who work in this field like me think it's the most exciting thing in the world, and everybody's interested in it, and that's true now, but it was not true in the 1950s. The 1950s is a bit of a, a fringe subject, really. Um, and it's interesting to note that he died in 1966, shortly after hearing uh, of the discovery of the microwave background, so he knew in the end that his theory was the right theory and that he had been correct after all these years. Now, should he get more credit? Various people have argued that he should really have received more credit for his discovery. Um, uh, some have suggested that the Matra's law should be called Hubble, uh, should be, sorry, Hubble's law should be called the Matra's law, but <coughs> it's important to note that Hubble was the first to observe it uh, experimentally, and we usually give credit to the experimental discovery. Uh, another example of that is the microwave background. That was discovered by Penzias and Wilson. They got the Nobel Prize, and uh, the, my Princeton acquaintances, Jim Peebles and his collaborators, got the footnote. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's, it's great to be a theorist, but they're going to give the Nobel Prize to the guys who actually discovered it, I'm afraid. Um, some have argued that he published in French in an obscure journal, and that held up his the appreciation of his research. I don't know enough of the history to say whether that's valid or not, but I think part of that is reading back the fact that now everyone speaks English and everyone publishes in English. They did have other languages back then. Um, and, um, or so they tell me. So, so, so German, of course, was the primary language. You could publish in German, you could publish in English, and you could publish in French. Um, Bob Kirshner claimed that the reason he doesn't get enough credit is that he abandoned cosmology for other things late in life, so he didn't have this stream of students and postdocs to carry on his name. Um, I think that's also very misleading because nobody uh, continued to work in cosmology for many years. Um, I think what really happened, and I, this is my own personal theory, uh, is that the reason people think that he didn't get credit, and I think he did get a lot of credit, I'm going to show you some evidence for that, is that nothing got named after him. And again, I, this goes back to my idea that when we teach physics, we basically ignore the history. And the only thing we don't ignore are the things that got named after people. So we teach Maxwell's equations, we teach Newton's laws of motion. And when I do cosmology, I teach the Friedman equation, and I teach the Hubble expansion, and those are the only two people whose names get mentioned in the class. So Friedman, uh, sorry, uh, um, unfortunately, he did not get the Friedman equation named after him, and he didn't get the Hubble expansion named after him. And I think for that reason, he maybe is considered a more obscure figure. But if you look at both stuff that was contemporary with his life and uh, appreciation after he died, Here's a Popular Science article. I love these old articles. They, they just didn't pull any punches. Popular Science, 1932, a blast of a giant atom. And so this guy in his the breathless, breathless style of that day says, 
Out of a single bursting atom came all the suns and planets of the universe. This is the sensational theory advanced by the famous Abbé Gilles Lemaitre, Belgian mathematician. It has aroused the interest of astronomers throughout the world. So, I mean, certainly, you know, at the time, he was as well known as any of his contemporaries. Um, and, you know, they wrote better articles back then. Um, I looked up his obituary in Physics Today when he died, and this is what it said. The originator of the Big Bang Theory of Cosmology, Georges Lemaitre, died in Lyon, um, Belgium, on 20th of June at the age of 71. Models of the expanding universe had been conjectured by Willem de Sitter and Alexander Frid Fridman. That was a misspelling in the, paper, in the story. But Lemaitre's is the most widely accepted theory. So certainly when he died, he was considered the father of the, the Big Bang. Um, he was, you know, and he certainly got also a lot of recognition in his life. He, he, he measured, he got a lot of awards. He was named president of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Apparently he was um, asked to serve on the Commission on Birth Control, but he turned them down. Um, and he lived, I think most importantly, he lived to see his theories vindicated. So I, you know, I, I would say that, that he certainly has gotten credit. I guess the only thing we could do today, uh, if you want to start a campaign, is to name uh, the cosmological constant, the Lemaitre constant, because it starts with an L and a lambda, and uh, you know it, it, would, it would work. Um, but certainly, I think it, I think his I think his reputation is also undergoing a bit of a rebirth. If I, I, I had to guess, it looks like he was quite well known during his lifetime. After the discovery of the microwave background, perhaps uh, not as much attention was paid to him. But certainly, you see a lot of, of um, papers now where the Friedman Robertson Walker metric, which is the metric that describes the expanding universe is sometimes called the Friedman Robertson Lemaitre Walker metric. Of course, it's not called that at all. It's called the FRLW metric, but his name is being added back in. So I think that in, in the end, um, I think he would have been happy with the level of, of uh, credit he's been getting, and I think he has been getting credit. Uh, and again, it's an example of, uh, I, I think, a, a very nice example of someone in consecrated life, a, a priest who has gone on to, to make major discoveries in science. It, it didn't end with the Renaissance. It's still going on. Uh, that's all I have to say. Why don't we stop now and we can, we can have discussion. <laughs>